the 20th century witnessed an astonishing revolution in physics. From unlocking the secrets of the atom, to working out the origins of the universe. Physics took us places we'd never dreamt possible. This was also a century when we were for the first time able to see and hear scientists in their own words. I began to notice there was something slightly curious on the records. I didn't take it in because I was probably daydreaming. And I can't stop. I mean, I, you could make, I could talk forever. So we began to learn not just about the science, but the men and women behind it. And the more we learnt about these scientists, the more it became clear that their personalities, eccentricities, and rivalries was that he was too short, too quick, Clay. were all fundamental to their discoveries. In fact, it's impossible truly to understand the 20th century revolution in physics without first knowing who these men and women really were. I see, and your idea is to find out what nature could be. At the same time as the revolution in quantum physics, scientists were also making great astronomical finds. Observations that would provide further proof of Einstein's theories. One of the most significant discoveries was made in the late 60s by an extremely determined young woman embarking on a career in the field of radio astronomy. The new instrument was perhaps the least glamorous telescope ever built and it was to be operated full-time by one person, a girl. Jocelyn Bell Burnell, however, was not just a girl. She was a talented scientist who had a lifelong passion for the night sky. I went away to boarding school at age 13. The physics teacher that I had, Mr Tillett, was a super teacher. I could well have had a physics teacher who took the view that girls couldn't do physics and what's the point of trying kind of thing. I'm not sure where I'd have gone then, what I'd have done, but uh, Mr Tillett was quite the opposite. I went to Glasgow and I was the only woman doing physics. And every time I entered the lecture theatre, as was the tradition, the guys whistled, stamped, catcalled, banged their desks. There was a, a them and me. I was rather on my own the whole time. In the early 1960s, Belle Burnell started her PhD as part of Martin Ryle's radio astronomy group at Cambridge University. She had found her spiritual home. It was here that Mr. Tillett's inspirational teaching and Glasgow University's trial by ordeal would start to bear fruit. The Cambridge Radio Astronomy Group had an interest in distant objects because they were interested in general in how the universe had evolved. But first, we had to build the radio telescope. And actually, I spent two of my three years constructing a radio telescope. She was outside in this muddy field, uh, literally building things that looked like a very large fence with wooden poles and wires strung between them. And it was quite a hard business. I think she must have become very, very fit because of all that. But it was quite a difficult, physically demanding life that she led when the telescope was being built. But it was only once the last cables were connected that the real work started. Belle Burnell was in charge of searching for tiny bright objects far out in the cosmos. We were actually using this telescope to look for quasars because they twinkle. And this thing specially designed to pick out twinkling things. And after we'd been running, I suppose about a few months, I began to notice there was something slightly curious on the records. 
they came out as paper charts. And, of course, on these charts you could see radio sources, and, unfortunately, you could also see man-made interference. But there was also something that didn't quite fit either bill. It wasn't exactly a twinkling radio source, and it wasn't exactly interference either. Everybody's first reactions were that it must be man-made. Including Bell Burnell's supervisor, Anthony Hewish, who was convinced there had to be a terrestrial explanation for the anomaly on the paper chart. We wrote round to all the astronomical observatories in sort of Britain saying, have you had any programme going which might possibly cause radio interference? But the observatories wrote back with the all clear. There was nothing obviously interfering with her telescope. It's very easy when doing research to try and brush over those things that don't quite fit into your, your, your view of things. It's much easier, much more convenient if it sort of fulfills your prejudices. She didn't do that. She found this thing which actually didn't really make sense and she kept at it and was concerned as it became more and more obvious that it wasn't making any conventional sense. So I think that approach was very important. Bell Burnell enlisted the help of another radio telescope to prove to all her doubters that the signal was in fact coming from the cosmos. She finally convinced Hewish that this was something to pay attention to. The big mystery was what in the universe could be producing this signal. It looked like a series of equally spaced pulses. I don't know what I had expected, but I certainly didn't expect regular pulsations. Stars and galaxies don't pulse like that. Hewish ruled out the possibility that it was coming from an object because it pulsed too regularly and quickly for any known star or galaxy, which led them to consider another explanation. Second reactions, not really voiced very loud, were, well, perhaps it's little green men. While the leaders of the radio astronomy group started considering their response to alien communication, Bell Burnell remained unconvinced and returned to her telescope. She was very self-contained, very self-motivated, somebody who kept herself to herself, wasn't really a great socialite in the group. Not that my memory is that it was a particularly social group, but there were people who would get together, but she was somebody who tended to be and preferred to be on her own. Sometimes in research you can know too much and it's the youngster who's ignorant or somebody coming in from outside that says, you know, the emperor has no clothes on, but actually is telling the truth, can see the truth. I think in order to make scientific discoveries, you really have to be open to the possibility of something quite unexpected. Jocelyn was somebody who was open to that and she found something quite unexpected. Bell Burnell was rigorous keeping meticulous records and analysing them in painstaking detail. She was dogged in her pursuit of an explanation. So I was analysing chart from another piece of sky and thought I saw a piece of this scruffy kind of signal. Looked exactly like what I was seeing before, but from a totally different bit of the sky. Right. I thought, I'm not going to bed tonight, I'm going out to the observatory. And I switched on the high speed recorder and it came blip, 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 blip. Clearly the same family, the same sort of stuff. And that was great. That was really sweet. Now, the people here say that if they got three signals as exactly spaced as that, it would be very unusual. If they got four, it would be phenomenal. Well, they've had pulses as exactly spaced as that 24 hours of the day since November. It was easier with the second one, and that was a great relief in many ways, because it removed this possibility of it being little green men. Highly unlikely that several lots of little green men would be all signalling to us, all at the same frequency, all at the same time. With little green men ruled out, this had to be a brand new type of cosmological object, behaving in a way that astronomers had never expected. 
the faint blips from space so nearly dismissed as error took the world by storm. The new objects were called pulsars because they pulsed so regularly. For Belle Burnell, it was a personal vindication for her years of struggle. Seeing the article in print was tremendous. And I remember sending a copy of the paper to my physics teacher. And that's your physics teacher at the Mount? At the Mount, yes. My physics teacher at the Mount. And how did he react to it? He had actually alerted the school. There was a lot of publicity. Mr Tillett had seen this and told the school. There aren't so many people that take up physics as a profession and certainly relatively few women of my generation. So Mr Tillett followed with some interest my career. And I was really pleased that he was still around at the time of the discovery. Further investigation showed that pulsars are the dense remains of rapidly spinning dead stars that emit beams of radiation. With each rotation, the beam sweeps in and out of the Earth's line of sight. And when they're found in pairs, they gradually move closer to each other. This behavior indicated the existence of gravitational waves, distortions in space-time produced by massive objects. It's a phenomenon predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. It was the strongest evidence yet for the theory that Einstein had developed using just the power of maths and abstract thought. Professor Anthony Hewish. Anthony Hewish won the 1974 Nobel Prize for his role in the discovery of pulsars. Controversially, Bell Burnell was not included but she has remained remarkably philosophical about it. You can actually do extremely well out of not getting a Nobel Prize. And I have had so many prizes and so many honours and so many awards that actually I think I've had far more fun than if I'd got a Nobel Prize, which is a bit flash in the pan. You get it, you have a fun week and it's all over. And nobody gives you anything else after that because they feel they can't match it. But Bell Burnell's discovery not only advanced our understanding of the universe, it also forced physicists around the world to think twice before they dismiss the unconventional. The scene was now set for other novel ideas in cosmology to be taken a little more seriously than before. In 